Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming out on a humid <laughs> afternoon. Um, we're very pleased here at the United States Institute of Peace to welcome you to a discussion uh, of opposed development. And this is an, an idea, a concept, uh, not without controversy, I hope will be the case <laughs> this afternoon. Um, otherwise, you'll be bored, and I promise you, you will not be bored. We've had a little opportunity to, to talk among ourselves, and I suspect you will have a very lively discussion. Um, opposed development um, is where someone uh, is trying, a, a host government is trying to develop and it's getting assistance uh, from the international community or from its own resources to help provide services to its people, uh, health, education, security, justice. Um, these are the kinds of things that, will, that, that characterize development, and there are places in the world where that development is not opposed. Okay, <laughs> and that's one category of, uh, of activity. There are other places where it is opposed, and it can be opposed by people shooting at you or people are opposing with an alternative idea or alternative set of services. That, that's opposed development that we want to discuss. It's still development, I think, although there may be a challenge even to that, uh, uh, that conclusion. But what we'd like to do is, is tease out, is discuss, is try to identify the differences between opposed development uh, and unopposed development and see what the implications are, see what the policy implications are. Um, organizationally, they may be different. The U.S. government, some of the U.S. government is somewhat uh, represented here, uh, uh, may want to organize differently. Uh, when there is a general officer in the country along with the ambassador, uh, U.S. ambassador, U.S. general officer, that's a different organization than when you don't have military on the ground. When there's military on the ground in opposed development, that means there's a different character. That means there's a different character to, to the operation, and we want to try to explore that. And as I say, there are policy implications uh, in terms of funding, in terms of uh, organization, in terms of duration. So these are the kinds of things we'd like to pull out. At the Institute of Peace, uh, we do ideas and we do actions. Uh, we do thinking and we do doing. And, uh, so we do have the opportunity to do some thinking with this panel and you, uh, today, uh, so that we can, in our action, we have offices, of course, in Kabul and, and Baghdad and do work around the world, we have an opportunity to put those into practice and test them and those kind of things. So uh, that brings me to this panel. And this panel is remarkable uh, in its uh, thinking and doing, um, in its uh, work in the field and in its uh, thinking about what it's done uh, over time. We're going to start out with Dave Cullen. Um, many of you, most probably in, in this room, everyone knows uh, he's already signed a couple of books on the way in. Uh, uh, famous author, uh, the one I know best, the read, read a couple of times, is The Accidental Gorilla, but he has others and I think another one coming out soon. Also, just back from his honeymoon, so we're very pleased to have uh, Dave here. Nancy Lindborg, um, also well known to uh, everyone here, also a thinker and a doer, uh, president of Mercy Corps. Um, has a great perspective on how how development works um, and has done some things in opposed bill. The fact is, I think, in Pakistan, you guys just suspended because of some opposition here. So anyway, there, she knows of, of what we're speaking about here today. Andrew Natsios, also known to everyone here, uh, direct, uh, administrator of USAID, um, knows a lot about Afghanistan and Iraq, knows something, therefore, about opposed development, uh, and is now teaching at Georgetown. Right, got it right. Andrew Wilder, two Andrews in a, row, in a row, don't get confused. Andrew Wilder uh, just flew down this morning, uh, Monday actually, he came down earlier this week, uh, from Tufts where he's a research director as well as professor, um, well known to people who have followed this uh, literature and we're very pleased to hear Andrew's thoughts on, uh, uh, also a doer, I mean a thinker who I've already indicated, also a doer, spent a lot of time, I think uh, grew up in Pakistan, but also spent a whole lot of time in Afghanistan. Uh, so thinking and doing comes naturally to him. And Jim Shear, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense, uh, for this kind of work. Uh, he is uh, super well qualified for the thinking and the doing. And without anything else, I am going to let Dave Kukulun kick us off. Dave. And w what we'll do, if this is all right, um, we'll have 10 minutes or so from each. After Dave speaks, for example, I'll ask the panelists um, first, you'll get your turn, but I'm first going to ask the panelists if they have comments or questions for Dave, just for clarification. 
Similarly, then Nancy will do her opening remarks, similar opportunity for the panelists, and then Andrew, and then Andrew, and then Jim. Uh, after that, we'll open it up, and we'll have an opportunity to have a conversation. Dave. Okay. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, so I think I've been asked to go first because I came up with the term um, <laughs> opposed development. But of course, uh, I didn't come up with the thing. Um, we, we've been doing it for a long time. And I'm very, very conscious not only of the incredible depth of expertise of people on the panel, but also in the audience. And I, I won't embarrass people by naming them, but I, I see some, some of the people that are, have contributed the most to what we're doing out on the ground today in this field sitting here in the audience. So. Um, what I thought I'd do is just really set the scene for a few minutes about what are we talking about here? What are we talking about? What are we not talking about? Um, what are the basic characteristics of this thing that we may choose to call, call uh, opposed development? And what are just some of the implications? And I think we're going to get a lot more into the implications uh, as the afternoon goes on. Um, so some background first. Uh, as all of us know, U.S. foreign assistance tripled under the Bush administration from about $9 billion a year in 2000 to about $27 billion a year by 2008. The Obama administration have talked about doubling it again to over $50 billion a year. Um, we've also seen in that same time frame the proliferation of new forms of foreign assistance. And we might immediately think of things like the Millennium Challenge uh, Corporation and PEPFAR and so on, but there are also sort of pseudo-national security forms of foreign assistance that have really become important uh, in the last eight to ten years. And the obvious one is SERP, the Commander's Emergency Response Program, uh, and 1206 and 1207 funding, which are forms of foreign assistance administered by the Department of Defense, making DOD, in fact, quite an important, though not, not a formal, uh, participant in, in the U.S. Uh, development and foreign assistance uh, program. Now, this tsunami of cash is being managed by uh, an organization, USAID, that was set up to, um, and in fact is in, still in the main oriented, uh, to operate in the peacetime provision of official development assistance to developing countries. And so there's an orientation issue. Um, how do we orient uh, to the current environment? And as of uh, the end of 2007, you find that if you look at where the U.S. foreign assistance budget is being spent, at no time since um, 2007 has it been less than 50 percent, and it sometimes it's been much higher than 50 percent of that budget is being spent either in conflict environments or post-conflict environments. So we've got an organization designed for traditional peacetime uh, assistance to developing countries uh, that's now had some of its responsibility taken over by other organizations and is, in fact, doing the bulk of its work in uh, conflict and post-conflict environments, um, environments that you might call opposed development environments. Now, those environments have some special characteristics, and let me illustrate that um, by way of a couple of examples. First of all, imagine that you're a US aid officer, and you're in a normal, classical, traditional, whatever you want to call it, a peacetime development environment. First of all, you have no enemy as such you have a series of development targets that you are trying to deal with. Say you're running public health programs, then you might be interested in infant and uh, maternal mortality. Say you're running education programs, you will be interested in, in access to, uh, to educational materials, uh, access to schooling, those sorts of issues. Um, you have various traps and pitfalls that you need to consider in a development environment. There'll be spoilers out in the environment who may choose to undermine or disrupt the program that you're trying to running that you're trying to run. There'll be the classic dependency trap. There'll be issues of elite capture, where you may bring uh, a free good into a society affected by scarcity, and power brokers in that society are going to try and capture and exploit uh, that free good for their own uh, benefit. There'll be perverse incentives to corruption associated with just just the mere fact that you're bringing a lot of uh, new resources into uh, the society. There will be issues of crowding out, where you bring in new resources that may inadvertently put uh, local players out of business who are already trying to deliver the same sorts of services uh, that, you are, that you are now delivering, and you may, in fact, create enmity and, and opposition uh, in that process. 
so that's the sort of normal development environment. And there are problems and there are traps and you will sometimes generate opposition. But fundamentally, what you're doing is working a set of programs against a set of targets. Now let's take a second example. Imagine you're the same aid officer, but now there's a terrorist enemy in the environment and they're targeting you and targeting your implementing partners and the people that are working with you to carry out your projects. Well, fundamentally, if you think about what you're doing, although the threat environment is different, your job is still basically the same. Uh, you're still um, not really targeting an enemy as such. You're still working on development targets. You're just doing it in a much more high-risk uh, environment. Um, and those risks you know, include dangers and hardships, but also accountability risks. It's harder to get out and monitor your projects. It's harder to know whether the workforce is turning up on time. It's harder to put in place accountability procedures that allow you to track where the money goes just because it's a more dangerous environment and it's harder to get out there uh, and do those things. And in addition, all the pre-existing problems that I just spoke about, elite capture, the dependency trap, crowding out local entrepreneurs, all those issues are still there. Um, you're just doing your job in a tougher environment. It's opposed, but there's no enemy. But now think about a third type of environment, and that is if you're running an aid program in a counterinsurgency or stability operations environment. Now there's an organized enemy in the picture. And that organized enemy isn't just a terrorist, they're actually running their own development and political programs. And so now you are not only running your program in isolation against a set of development targets, there's an enemy aid officer out there running a competing program against yours. And that fundamentally, in my view, changes the nature of the enterprise because you're no longer working against uh, a set of targets or metrics or issues where you're trying to fix a particular problem. You're doing that, but from the standpoint of the local population, they now have a choice. Which, which access to justice program, <laughs> the Taliban program or the Afghan government's program sponsored by us, gives them a better result. Uh, there's, there's now a sort of swing voter mentality among a lot of the people that are taking uh, advantage of our development and assistance programs. Again, you still have all the same problems as before, and you have still the high threat environment. More importantly, as you're out in that environment, there's probably now a US military organization operating in that, that environment because it's a development uh, program that's happening in the context of counterinsurgency or stabilization. And in my uh, field experience over 20 years or so, as soon as you bring a US general officer into a theater, it changes dramatically what everybody else is doing. It changes the context for not only you, but also the host nation. So let's, let's look at some, some practical examples real quickly. Um, the Israel-Hezbollah war in 2006, the very day that the firing stopped, Hezbollah had its reconstruction units out on the ground running uh, programs to rebuild buildings that had been collapsed by um, Israeli bombs made by the US, dropped from Israeli aircraft, provided by the US, uh, using U.S. intelligence. And so we in the State Department said, mm, we probably need to get out there and do some reconstruction in order to undermine some of the negative effect of Hezbollah uh, rebuilding buildings that our ally Israel just destroyed. Um, we found ourselves in a competitive environment where Hezbollah were basically charging NGOs money for the privilege of rebuilding destroyed structures with a Hezbollah flag over the top. And when we turned up... Uh, a week to 10 days after the Hezbollah representatives already started working, most of the projects had already been allocated to somebody else. Another example is the Sadrists in 2007, Muqtada al-Sadr's organization in Baghdad. As we were running security operations in Baghdad city, the Sunnis would attack Shia communities and there was a, a number of incidences where uh, the Shia population of a given area were displaced to um, a temporary refugee camp Within an hour or two, the SADA organization are there providing short-term humanitarian assistance, assistance in getting jobs, relocation assistance, um, and uh, long-term uh, community organizing type assistance. Again, in competition with the Iraqi government and US forces in Iraq. So if you're an aid officer in that environment, there's some fundamental differences about what you're trying to do because it's now competitive in a different way. Uh, and I won't even touch on the Taliban because we're lucky enough to have Andrew Wilder here and he can give you chapter and verse on 
uh, Taliban governance and uh, business development and agriculture and taxation and, uh, you know, rule of law programs that are out there competing uh, with our programs. Um, I want to draw a distinction between opposed development and stabilisation programming. Um, I think that stabilisation program is, pro is probably a subset of opposed development. I'm looking down here at Jim and Sloan because they wrote the book literally on... Uh, on uh, stabilisation programming. So I'd be interested to see what you guys have to say about that aspect um, as the, the discussion develops. Let me just quickly then finish with some ideas of what the implications might be. Firstly, I think there's a pretty clear need for uh, more fungible and flexible funding arrangements for some of the aid officers out on the ground in places like Afghanistan and Pakistan. If you turn up in a district now and you have money for public health, most times you only get to spend that money on public health. And if you turn up in the district and it turns out that the Taliban's running a really effective rule of law program and what you really need to be doing is improving access to transitional justice for the population, bad luck, buddy, you just have money for public health. Uh, so changing that um, is, is something that we may want, want to think, at, think about. Now, a portion of the aid budget is already fungible and flexible in that way, but we maybe need to think about proportions. The second thing we need to think about is early entry capability. And I use that term advisedly. It's... When the situation is still fluid, it's early in a process, the military are out on the ground in force without a lot of idea about how to do development. I say that as a military guy, right? Um, but they just want to get something done. And there's a need to get advisors out on the ground early, firstly with a preventing harm uh, approach, and secondly, ensuring that the short-term actions that all these very energetic guys are taking on the ground in the first days, weeks, and months of an operation are aligned with longer-term uh, best practice development and also longer-term uh, objectives of the US government in relation to what happens in that environment. So that, that early entry capability means mobility, communications, the ability to operate in a high-risk environment, uh, the ability to hire and fire people in a way that works properly in a war zone, all those sort of elements that make an expeditionary uh, foreign assistance capability. Third implication is... Um, remote monitoring capability. Uh, I wish I had a dollar for every time some Afghans showed me a Polaroid photo of some random bridge and said, this is your project that we're working on. Uh, there's no way to know if that's your project or somebody else's project or a picture downloaded from the internet. And we're paying people money, oftentimes, on the basis of uh, very scant information because we can't get out on the ground without a four- or five-day organisation process to get a military convoy to take a guy out to have a look at the project, and it just becomes very... Uh, difficult. Now, Sloan Mann here in the audience uh, and Eric Meissner before him pioneered the idea of the embedded aid officer working with uh, special forces and uh, general purpose forces on the ground and got around some of that. But it doesn't uh, address the bigger picture of how, how the ordinary aid officer in a PRT gets out to 10 or 12 pr uh, projects in a week. Things like sub-tactical uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs, are a possible technological fix. Things that OTI does with its own local Afghan workforce are, are another approach. But we have to sort of do a bit of work on um, how to think about those. Out of time? Nope, you're fine. Right. Finish up. Um, <laughs> fi final point would be that aid is as small as it, as it is because the basic aid business model is to bring in contractor implementing partners to do most of the work. Uh, that model would tend to work very well, I think, in a traditional development environment, but perhaps less well in an environment where your implementing partners may not choose to go to the most dangerous parts of a country or they may choose to go do something cheaper in another country rather than get caught up in the sorts of work that you want them to do. And so perhaps there's a requirement in an opposed development environment to carry more of the execution capacity inside the organisation itself rather than uh, relying on implementing partners. Um, and then finally, and I, again I default to Andrew and also to, in fact, to both Andrews on this, but traditional development approaches in an opposed development environment may actually have a destabilising rather than a stabilising effect. And we need to think about uh, whether that's because development doesn't really work, and there's an argument out there that that's true, or whether it's because we're doing it wrong in places like Afghanistan and Pakistan. So let me stop there. There's a lot of issues there, and I'm, I have the privilege of just raising questions instead of answering them. No, Dave, um, you have done more than that. Just stay, stay there for a moment, because there may be questions. Does anyone on the panel have any clarifying questions or comments for Dave at this point? Going once. All right. No, now you can say it. David, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the originator of this concept, uh, uh, David Collins, thank you very much.
Nancy Lindbergh. Thank you. Nice, provocative beginning, Dave. Thank you. It's great to be here, and thank you, Bill, for convening us. Um, I think these are, in fact, some of the really um, weighty issues that we've been wrestling with. And um, as Bill mentioned, I'm the president of Mercy Corps, which is an NGO that works primarily in what we call transitional environments, about 40 around the world, and it includes every one of the countries that you mentioned and, and others. And we really think of transitional environments as, as countries where there's a fragility of government that precludes them from being able to meet the needs of their citizens, from basic goods to problem solving, and they're especially vulnerable to shocks. So any kind of natural disaster or conflict or economic collapse is particularly destabilizing. Um, that what you do um, in those environments will greatly shift depending upon the you know issues um, like is there an armed insurgency? Is the U.S. military present? And I think some of those factors um, that Dave mentioned as fundamental to oppose development do change how we think about what we're doing. But I'm just going to put a stake on the ground here and say I, I, I think there's a problem with the concept of opposed development as, as at a real fundamental level, not that it isn't a useful taxonomy to think about this collection of characteristics as being an important way to think about the kinds of interventions and, and what various actors do. But rather, um, you know, especially if we peg to um, what the Presidential Security Directive, I think, has tried to do um, uh, with the, the, the greater elevation of development and helping us at a strategic level to think of what is the role and relationship of development to diplomacy and to defense, and to more broadly define the role of development to our national security, broadly defined in terms of when we have stable partners um, out there who can help us collectively meet the world's challenges. Um, that's the goal of development, and there's a narrower definition that comes into play with the use of complex development. And, or, or sorry, opposed development. And when you have opposed development, it sounds as if you are um, in an environment where the people themselves are not in a position to move forward on their futures. And I would posit that fundamental to the concept of development <laughs> is that you have country-led approaches or uh, community-led approaches where they are charting the course forward that they are able to have an investment and a hope and an active role in their futures. So they may be doing that even in the midst of armed insurgencies, or maybe they're not, and good development isn't happening because of the lack of security. But I would posit that a lot of what ha must happen, particularly in these highly post-kinetic environments or where there is the presence of armed insurgents, is an important activity, but it may not be development, um, and that these kinds of conversations are critical, I think, for just getting common understandings and alignments of our various terms. I know there's been a lot of conversation about what does stability mean, and he pointed to somebody here who uh, was, was integral in that definition. And, you know, the, the, I think the question that we think about in our own work at Mercy Corps is, um, is st uh, stability necessary to even begin the pathway of development? And what are those activities that enable you to get to stability and security and what we would think of as ambient security so that people can begin to start making that active investment in their lives? How do you sequence those activities? What actors with which capabilities are critical to have on the ground? Um, and how do, you, how do you resource those capabilities as a policymaker? Um, one of the things that um, I know that we, we're – there's a lot of conversation about a whole-of-government effort to coordinate, and I want to make a couple of points on that. First is that um, I think we all understand the importance of coordinated approaches. Um, I would argue strongly that it needs to be coordinated but differentiated, differentiated bo both with the civilian capacities but also with the partners outside the government who have an important added value that you want to be able to leverage both short-term and long-term for your goals in a particular environment. Um, there's a, and Bill had posed a number of issues for us to think about in the context of opposed development. Um, the different 
the different ways that we would think about time frames, um, the capabilities of various actors, and the kinds of projects that they might do. <laughs> and I want to just give a couple of examples because um, Mercy Corps, for example, began working in Iraq in April '03 at the conclusion of the, the, the hot war, I would say. And we went into South Central Iraq where we had not operated before, so we had to do a lot of work to establish ourselves as um, an actor that was, uh, first of all, non-governmental, which they didn't really understand, um, and secondly there to enable the community to organize and identify what it is they wanted to do. And I want to underscore the importance of having that flexible funding that enabled us to do an activity that was tailored to the context of that community and tailored to what they said that they wanted and be able to then move with that community through an iterative cycle of projects that mm -hmm. built on immediate, almost peace dividend kind of activities that um, helped them understand that there was an immediate benefit to this new era and to a peaceful environment, but then move that increasingly into more developmental activities where they were more engaged, where they had um, community structures that enabled them to identify, and they co-invested. Very, very importantly, they were responsible for a significant amount of investment, um, either resource, other, other financial or material or labor or all three. And embedded in this process was an opportunity to then go to local authorities to try to enable um, budget investment from the local authorities. So it, in other words, it's, it was a multi-year effort to move from an immediate post-kinetic environment with activities that were pretty short and designed to have tangible, understandable benefits, and then handshake into the longer-term development. And it's that kind of flexibility of resources in, in its a time frame with the same people working on the project over a period of years that I think um, w enabled us to feel like we were starting to make a difference. There's a study that we have done that's available in the back of the room. Um, Heather Hansen here is our Director of Public Affairs is able to ask more questions, uh, answer more questions, where we looked at what were the benefits of community-led development with our programs in Iraq and Afghanistan, and it's very much um, our own efforts to try to understand how was it effective. What we learned is the three critical um, attributes that the communities themselves most valued was the opportunity to have full participation of all the elements, um, that they felt that they were able to engender greater trust, um, and that they were able to be clearly a part of the decision making. Um, so I think the ability to do that um, is vested much more strongly with civilian agencies because by virtue of being in a uniform, you are allied with the national interest of that country mm -hmm. whose uniform you're wearing. And that's an important and critical role that, that the uniformed personnel are playing, but it is not, it's not going to be seen as fundamentally the self-interest of the community members with whom you're working. So the more we understand the fundamental values and the extraordinary capabilities that the military does bring and we need to bring to these environments, but look at the core capabilities <laughs> of each of these groups, I think the better we'll be able to look at how we make a difference. And it's far from an easy effort. There's also a security dimension. And if you believe that there's an added value, which I strongly do, of both civilian action and with NGOs, that, that differentiation must be strong. And I just want to cite, there was a recent um, USAID uh, request for assistance in Yemen, where on an open source website, they cited the need for the implementing partner to coordinate closely with the special operations who were dedicated to hunting insurgents. That, I think, is not helpful to either objective. And that while that coordination might be important to have somewhere, you don't strongly link that on the ground in a way that I believe will undermine the effectiveness of both approaches. Um, recommendations, and I look forward to the conversation because I don't think we've solved this as a community, as a government, and these are the critical issues um, to continue wrestling with. I would f so agree with the need for, for more and more flexible resources that enable the highly contextual work to happen at the community level. I would argue strongly for increased resources at USAID. It does have strong capabilities to work in these more complex development environments, but it needs more. 
and it needs a greater ability to put civilian actors out in, I think the answer, the question that we haven't answered fully is what do you do in those immediate post-kinetic environments where it's still very hot and, and understandably something has to happen right away. Is it an embedded civilian force? Is it something the military just handles? I think that's an open and important question. Um, and finally, I would just um, underscore very, very strongly that you need to have differentiation. You need to create the glide path for those development actors to get on the ground as early as feasible to bring those development principles forward and be able to stay for the long term and really move the development agenda forward in a way that's connected to some of those early um, provision of needs and services. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Great, uh, great contrast here. Let me ask the panel if they've got questions. Uh, I have one. So if the military is there, in the immediate post-conflict uh, that you said. It's not development? Is that, is that what you say? I, th I think that the military, by definition, is very challenged in enabling development at, as a community-led process because you are in a uniform. If I'm a military officer, I'm a, I am in uniform, and I am sworn to uphold the interests of my country. That's, uh, that's fundamentally true. However, that may not always be perceived by a community as in their interests. They may have different interests, and development has to be about enabling those communities to move forward in a way which they're invested in their future, and they, are, they participate in the way forward. There may be a happy coincidence um, of activity, but I would strongly argue that people, that the military is not our best tool for promoting development. They right. may provide and very important early services. Um, we've seen the extraordinary value of the military in a humanitarian crisis, Haiti being the most recent example. I mean, it's extraordinary. But that's not development. Any comments from the, from the panel here? Dave? I, I would just have one comment, which is a, a very, very obvious point, which is, um, you know, none of this is new, right? I mean, we had this exact same problem in Vietnam. Um, we, we had this exact problem in the uh, 1990s in post-Cold War humanitarian intervention. Um, and we've all been struggling with this stuff for, you know, a very long time. Um, yes, we have. I think what is, what is new in the current mix is a huge number of military officers with new funding mechanisms like mm. SERP, 1206, mm. 1207, that are out there with essentially, let's say, development-like authorities. <laughs> um, so there's now a bunch of other players out there in the environment. And that, that, I think that's one of the things mm -hmm. we need to think about. And Andrew will address that, right? Yeah. We're counting on <laughs> One of the two will. One of the two Andrews. One of the Andrews. And the first Andrew is Andrew Natchez. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I, uh, I, I was going to start off by saying that this is not new. We've been struggling this for a long time. Fred Cuny used to say to me, Andrew, we keep doing the same thing over and over again, making the same mistakes, and that's why there's been an effort to try to create evaluations and all that. There's a huge literature on this, and we, I'm not sure we're any closer now than we were before. Uh, I brought back uh, a guy named Frank Kenefek, who was a, a development engineer, career foreign mm -hmm. service officer. He was an uh, – he's not here, so I can say he was an older guy. He was not young, but he was uh, – <laughs> He was brilliant in Afghanistan. He was the senior guy managing the road project from Kabul to Kandahar. And, uh, you know, we built these large asphalt plants to pave the road. And he said, you know, Taliban and al-Qaeda can blow up those plants with one mortar shell because if those light on fire, we don't have fire engines to turn them out. And I said, why aren't they doing it, Frank? I don't understand why they're letting us do They're killing a lot of our staff, but they're not stopping the project. And they could do it very quickly. And he said, they're harassing us, but this road is so popular with the Afghan people and the Pashtuns, which is the area that we were moving through, which is the ethnic base of the Taliban, that they can't afford to be seen as destroying it. Because if they blow it up, everybody will know who did it. And he said the same thing happened when he was running road and development projects in the communist insurgency in Thailand in the 1970s in northern Thailand. He went through... The exact same thing happened. He said they could have killed us any moment. They didn't because the health, and, uh, the health clinics and the roads uh, were tied with the schools, all integrated together when they would move into a, an insurgent area. And he said they couldn't bring themselves to kill us all because the people would be so upset they would lose their base of support. 
So I just want to add a little bit to what Nancy said. I don't agree with what everything that Nancy is suggesting, but I agree with a lot. And I, I would say most interesting at all in Iraq is a, a, a fatwa that was issued by the Ayatollah Sistani, one of the, the greatest religious figure among the Shia. He issued a fatwa saying it is okay for any Shia, 55% of the population, to work for USAID by name and their partner organizations, but not for reconstruction that is managed by the Defense Department. He made, and he was, you know, he was not an intimate of the U.S. I don't think any of our people ever met him because he refused to meet any U.S. government officials. He knew the difference. It's very interesting to me that he would issue a fatwa of that kind. Uh, I don't know exactly when it was issued, but I was told by some of the people there were taken aback that he could make the distinction, obviously, between the civilian reconstruction program, which he understood, and that was, was not civilian. It was run by the military. And I'm a, a former civil affairs officer. I'm not hostile to the military at all. My son's in the military, and uh, but there is there needs to be it seems to me a greater degree of understanding by state and DoD of what the internal dynamics are of aid agencies, AID and its partner organizations and UN agencies, which they do not understand. They don't they don't understand the regulatory constraints AID is under. They don't understand the Foreign Assistance Act, the Inspector General's Office, the GAO. They don't, they don't understand the business model. And as a result, they make a lot of really very poor judgments in ordering things to be done that don't make a lot of sense legally, developmentally, or operationally in the field. And I think that's because AID has been so marginalized. I, I, I like to say at least one controversial thing. I have reached the conclusion now <laughs> that we need to amend President Kennedy's order of 1962 and take AID out of chief mission authority in every embassy in the third world. And I say that DFID has done that, and no one is arguing DFID is dysfunctional in the developing world. We are failing because AID is not allowed to do its work. Uh, people are telling uh, the embassies in Afghanistan, Iraq, and um, Pakistan not to do certain things. They're doing them. They've been, and, and, and there isn't a lot of difference between the Obama administration and the Bush administration in this point, I might add, because there's been no real effort in military schools or military schools better. I have to say they've made an effort. They have AID officers teaching. But the Foreign Service Institute, uh, we attempted to put a curriculum in place in the Foreign Service Institute in development, and the director, who is a former ambassador in the developing world, who is very supportive said, Andrew, this is a good idea. We're going to put it in. We'll have eight officers teaching. And the this faculty and the career staff said, absolutely not. That is not what we do. We are not going to train anybody. And then they took it out of the curriculum, which I found, frankly, unbelievable. Unbelievable. I think there are some, there are four fundamental problems between the three Ds. The three Ds are not going to be integrated without compromising the integrity of what the three are. And we are not, there are more clashes between the three, three Ds than there are, is commonality. And there's, a, there's a function, there's a, a, a disagreement over mission and mandates, statutory mission, statutory ma a practice, a theory. I mean, the development literature is very rich now. We can't follow what the development literature is telling us to do because AID has been so marginalized. Two, there's a huge difference in time horizon. The aid programs that don't work are ones that are too short-term, to actually institutionalize what the changes are. Aid is not, is, it is about getting ownership, but that is not sufficient. Aid is about building institutional capacity in the country, whether it's in the NGO community, the private sector, uh, profit sector, business community, or in the government. It's about building institutions that when the aid program ends and the funding ends, can carry on whatever it is that the program was. And if once the funding ends, the program doesn't continue, then you have a problem in terms of sustainability. We have lost the central problem of all development programs, whether it's the World Bank or the UN or the NGOs or AID, is the sustainability question. We used to integrate it in our programs, and AID is it's got more uh, engorged, uh, State Department's engorged aid. No one even talks about it anymore. It is the central problem. What happens when the funding stops? And if, if, if you're doing your work right and you do, over a 10-year period, you can actually make programs sustainable, but you can't do it in six months or a year. You're talking about really creating something that didn't exist before or, or strengthening institutions that are very weak or not existing. So time horizon is very important, and the demands of the military and the demands of diplomats in terms of time horizon is so short-term. I think that's one of the major problems with, uh, 
with counterinsurgency programs is the time frame is completely unrealistic. And when you tell people uh, it's unrealistic, what the reaction of state and DOD is, more state than DOD is, you're being uncooperative. I said, you know, you know don't sit here. You've never even run an aid program. I mean, you're dictating to us when these programs are going to be successful. They're not dependent on what we think or do or how much money we put. They're dependent on the society and the level of development that they're in. If you have an advanced society, which Iraq actually was, it's a little easier to actually create institutions. I, I talked to an aid contractor who's one of the best development people in Washington. I won't tell you his name. And he's working in the mission ministries in Iraq. And he said, I have never seen a professional class of people more embracing training than I've seen in 30 years that I've seen in Iraq. They want, the Iraqis want this to work so badly, they're actually integrating the training into the ministry's functions right now. And it's because of the stage of development in there, what they went through with Saddam and what they want to do for the future. The, this, a lot of our programming is dependent on the society in which we're, we're in. We act as though this is a mechanical thing. You create all these stupid metrics that the city is bogged down with that are supposed to be able to, in some doctrinaire way, in every society, in a cookie-cutter way, get every society in the same. You put enough money in, it comes out the other end exactly the same. That's complete nonsense. There is no, you know, the one thing Bill Easterly and, and, and Jeffrey Sachs agree on, the only thing is that these things need to be localized. And countries are not all at the same level of development. Their values are different, their worldview is different, and that profoundly affects the success of aid programs. Now, I wanted to conclude with some, some operational lessons we learned in Iraq and Afghanistan. It's a different matrix or layer of thinking that I think we need to start putting. And, and I, telephone law, the, the uh, electrical lines, and uh, the, the insurgency was already beginning. And I came back with a nine-page memo I wrote myself with uh, 11 recommendations. And it's interesting, it was supposed to be a 10-minute conversation with Condi, it was, it was an hour. And she said, Andrew, go back again, come back with more of these recommendations. And they're based on our observations of what was happening. And these are the comments. The first is, if you do a reconstruction program, which are typically thought of in health, you know, in different sectors, that's one way of, there's other ways of looking at development from a security standpoint, from an opposed development standpoint. Uh, if you have a development project which requires uh, interconnected infrastructure, like water mains and water lines, sewer mains, a, 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 a mountainous area where there's a, a highway project that has 100 bridges on it, one bridge goes out, the whole highway frankly shuts down. Or, most importantly, electrical lines. That is extremely high risk in an in insurgency. Why? All you have to do is blow up one two-feet section of a water line, a big water main, or take one line down. If you have a 300-mile uh, uh, distribution line for electrical, one down, the whole thing shuts down. I think the worst thing to do, frankly, are projects that require continuous 24-hour uh, security in these kinds of environments. In another environment where it's peaceful, it's very appropriate, but not in this environment because you open yourself to the insurgency. Secondly, you have point of service infrastructure like schools, health clinics, and water wells uh, where you can blow up the school, but blowing up the school will not shut down the entire project. It only shuts down that one mm -hmm. school. And once you get the, the teacher and the, the books and the kids in the classroom, really it's, it's a self-contained unit. And so those are still high risk because they're visible, and the military does like visible projects that everybody can see. But the, the, the great irony of, of reconstruction in a counterinsurgency is the more visible it is, and therefore it wins hearts and minds, the less viable it is developmentally because it's much more at risk from a security standpoint. Now, we have learned some things in Iraq and Afghanistan and Pakistan that are very interesting which is a third category, which are very low risk in terms of what happens uh, from in, in terms of uh, insurgency attacks. One are voucher programs. We ran a voucher program. This is uh, nothing to do with insurgency, but after the uh, – this was during the Clinton administration before I was at AIDS, so I had nothing to do with this. But 1998 was a brilliant idea. OFDA did uh, $90 – uh, voucher distributions to everybody affected by the Great Flood. 90,000 families, 100,000 families got these vouchers. And they rebuilt their houses, and they paid their school fees, bought clothes, because that was all destroyed in the flood. It, very low overhead. 
And once you give all the women, we did only women heads of household got the money, and we did an audit afterwards. It was very, very effective, very effective. It was invisible. Once the money was distributed, you didn't know who got the voucher and who didn't get it. We did the same thing in the Pakistan earthquake. We did vouchers through the NGOs for people. Instead of bringing stuff in from the outside, we told the Pakistani merchants in Islamabad and Karachi, you go up to the earthquake zone, you sell this stuff, we will give you vouchers through the NGOs, they, you redeem them, and you will buy stuff. You choose what you want. It was very popular. It affected the mass of people. So it was very effective in terms of winning hearts. And it was, once you pass them out, it was completely invisible. Seed programs, very useful. And fertilizer programs. We did this in the early stages of Afghanistan in 2002. Once the seeds distributed, you know, we found that we, we distributed a kind of seed that was um, very interesting because it, uh, was high yield. It increased by 1% to 200% yields. I actually had a farmer say, this is a miracle from Allah because I now have twice as much wheat with the same size plot. Now, we got this from the CGIR network. AID has been the biggest donor to this network. It's a subsidiary of the World Bank. It, it was in Syria. I actually had a, a people object to the fact it was from Syria. It's, not, it's an international organization. We collected this seed that was developed at this center all over the Middle East. We distributed an early O. Two, and it affected the crop in a big way, enough so that actually prices collapsed in, uh, for wheat because there's so much wheat being grown in uh, 2002. Um, and, but the seed program, once you distributed the seed, you know what the, the farmers did? They didn't eat the wheat. They, a lot of them kept the wheat seed for the next year. They said, this seed is producing massive amounts mm -hmm. of increased food. We're not going to eat this food. We're going to find some other way to eat. We're going to use this for the next crop, a seed. So once it got to the agricultural system, it was actually very effective at increasing yields and very invisible. What is Taliban going to go out and sh shoot 100,000 farmers because they get wheat seed? How will they know who got it and who didn't get it? Or, or mass employment programs. I mean, uh, you could say any collection of people doing work you could claim was somehow um, uh, run by the West by someone associated with the U.S. military AID, but the fact is it's when they start shooting very large numbers of people, they do lose their base of support. So I think um, these projects are not as visible. You can't put a big sign in a seed program. Once the seed's distributed, there's no sign. There's no evidence. Okay? The military is dominated by engineers. I mean, that's before Vietnam, everybody was an engineer who went to West Point or Annapolis. And there's a tendency to want to construct things. People take literally the term reconstruction. We used to go to NSC meetings, and I'd say, it does not mean physically reconstructing things. It means constructing institutions, governance. And people would not get what we were talking about. People say, you, you, are, you are diverting money into soft capacity building, community development, market pro so They used to call them soft programs. This used to infuriate me at these meetings. The point, finally, is this. We are not going to be able to fix this if AID continues to be marginalized in the interagency. Pro it needs to be at all the NSC meetings. It needs a permanent seat. We had a permanent seat from the beginning of Afghanistan <coughs> to the time I left. There's no AID officers at the NSC meetings anymore, deputies or principals meetings to sell the president that the DOD or state may be wrong on one of these things. The notion that the State Department has the two Ds is a very dangerous idea. I think, frankly, it, it's undermining the whole development approach. Not because, and I have great respect for our diplomats. I was a diplomat for a year and a half as envoy to Sudan. They are completely different disciplines. Even the Foreign Service system is different for how we select officers, how we train them, what the culture of the institution is, what they actually do for work. Completely different institutions. You can merge aid into state. You will not have a development agency anymore. Let me leave it at that. Andrew, hang on. Before you yes, leave oh, the, yeah. the podium, you had, the others have an opportunity here to uh, ask questions. Yes, Jim. Um, visibility and viability. I get the point. Um, but that road you referred to was very visible. Yes. Cell phone towers. But insurgents were self. There was self censorship because to hit that would hit a popular thing. So how do how do you reconcile well, those two points? Well, first, we built the road from Kabul to Kandahar in 13 months. We got a, you know uh, Louis Berger got an uh, American Association of Engineering award for what they did. I don't think most people know the the follow up on that. Taliban went in and blew up 
all 128 culverts. Now, for those, I wrote in the Big Dig for a little while, I know what a culvert is. It's to keep the water away from the road. The big enemy of roads is heavy trucks and water. If the water gets in the road, the road eventually gets washed out. Okay? They knew that if they blew the road up and all the bridges, they would get blamed for it. So what they did is they blew the culverts up. So water can do it. They can't get blamed for rain, you know. So, so there are subtle ways to undermine any kind of development project that requires sort of a continuous line of security. People don't even drive the road anymore, I'm told, because there's so many attacks on in terms of security. Now, cell phone towers are interesting because they don't have lines like a regular telephone line. So I would, I would categorize cell phone towers with our most pro successful program in Afghanistan was the radio program. <laughs> there are 58 radio stations, AID funded through <laughs> Internews and trained and did capacity. They're all private. The big TV and radio station in Kabul, all AID projects. There's a Harvard Business School case study on how successful we were with a very small amount of money. We too often associate the amount of money we spend with the importance of the program, which is a big mistake, by the way. Some of the most important things we do are the least funded, and the, some of the biggest funded things are the least effective. Okay? There's too much, too much quantitative measurements, too many metrics in this city that are, uh, that are completely counter-developmental in theory and practice with what really works. With what really works. So my point is the cell phone towers are an example of a moderate security risk, not low and not high, because you don't have the wires going between the cell phone powers. And you actually, one thing I did suggest is I read the, a book called The Grey, I think it was called The Grey Wolves. It was about the Nazi underground after World War II blowing up all our reconstruction of Germany because Hitler didn't end, you know, when the regime collapsed. There was an underground Nazi movement undermining the uh, Allied reconstruction of Germany. And what we did was, very interesting, I, I said we did it in World War II or after World War, we should have done the same thing. We went to the mayors of the cities in Germany and said, if they, if they blow up the electrical lines in your city that we can reconstruct, we are going to charge you higher taxes to fix them. That was punitive. I said, why don't you pay the tribal sheikhs along the, all of the areas that we're reconstructing that are distribution lines, and they get paid if they prevent any, and that, they did it. They actually did it. And, and I, I was most proud. But that came out of a Grey Wolves history of the underground Nazi movement in the late 1940s in Germany, a, a more positive incentive, which is you prevent the blowing up of the line in your area, your jurisdiction, and we will pay you. If, if it gets blown up, you don't get paid. Uh, the, after that happened, there was a precipitous drop in the number of lines being blown up. So there are ways to do it. But it, it requires, uh, I think, some institutional history. You know, all of the documents from the Marshall Plan are in AID's uh, archives, which are most of, are, are computerized now. The problem is there aren't any offices left to read the uh, documents because <laughs> the layoffs have been so bad uh, over the last, in the 1990s, and there aren't enough staff in AID. Nancy is absolutely correct. You want this to work, we need a couple thousand more offices than we have now. One last question, Dave. Or, uh, I'm not even yes. sure it's a question, but... Dave, you had a case study about road building in Kunar, where, <coughs> where, but I don't think it was USAID who did it. It was the military, or was it AID? Uh, there was a lot of AID funding went into that project. Um, that that case study was a case study not of a development project as such. It was a case study of the way that a uh, given series of military units used the existence of a pre-existing development project as a mechanism to uh, create uh, local governance and to uh, create networks for the population to start solving their own problems. So I, I characterize it as political maneuver in the book. Unfortunately, that's, that's a rare exception in uh -huh. Afghanistan. Um, but I, I think just, just to sort of build on that, our best practice that we've developed over the last few years has shown us that the idea that um, hearts and minds are one better from more visible projects is actually fallacious. It's, it's not true. Um, you do a lot better with low visibility, hmm. even in a counter, straightforward counterinsurgency sense. And I think one of the reasons why we're all sitting at this table is we've discovered that best practice counterinsurgency and best practice development turn out to be very closely aligned, in fact. The sorts of things you want to do in terms of ownership and community buy-in, small local projects, um, making sure that the visibility is low, you know, all those sorts of things that you do in any best practice development project also are essential to effective counterinsurgency. Um, I, I'm very interested to hear what Andrew Wilder says about that because, I mean, we haven't done so well in Afghanistan 
with any of the the stabilization effect of development. We've made the assumption that if you do development right, it just is magically going to have a stabilizing effect. But there's another whole school of thought about this, which, again, I defer to Jim and Sloan on, that if you actually go out and treat the sources of instability as you target and you make someone's day job fix that source of instability and you track against that, then you can get a different result. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't, I'd be with Nancy on this. I, don't, I wouldn't call that development. I'd call that stabilization programming. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's a different activity. Yeah. Andrew, did you have... You know, just on the road thing, again, in terms of the popularity of roads, I mean, it's been popular with a number of people, and one is, I think, the people appreciated them, um, but also, I'm not sure that's the reason why the road wasn't damaged. I mean, the Taliban also like them, because they get a lot of resources from roads. Um, you get a lot more money from the building of a road and then the taxing of the people traveling on the road from a good road than a bad road. And so... And I think there's quite a bit of growing evidence on the, the significant amounts of money from these major road building projects and other infrastructure projects slipping in. So the popularity might have been the popularity of the Taliban liked him as a revenue source. And I think a similar point for communication towers is quite a bit of evidence that they get quite a bit of money back, you know, through threatening to blow them up unless you get a kickback. Um, and so I think there's those kind of dynamics at play. And it's also very popular with donors, in particular the U.S., because when you have lots of money to spend quickly, roads are a good way to do it. But that would go back to my argument that the low risk category of vouchers, of seed distribution, of things that are very invisible and not heavily structural, you can't blow them up easily, yeah. mean that the ability of Taliban to tax those kinds of activities is far lower, I would argue. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Matt. Andrew, two points you made that I really resonate with. The yes. first is, you know, the whole sustainability issue yes. and, and how do you move more quickly into things that are market driven as opposed yes. to market right. undermining. And secondly is this whole um, this whole issue of the burn rate, uh, determining oh, successive heavens. programs. So from your perspective of having been at the helm of USAID and, and um, aware of all the competing forces that, that come to play on that, I mean, we've seen over and over again that as a metric, it's probably the least useful of all. You're always a diplomat. And it's, the <laughs> it's the stupidest metric. Okay. It's not just low but, and, in, and in fact, it can mask or undermine those activities that are truly helpful and create a whole <coughs> different layer of problems. So how do you see uh, the best possible well, well, navigation out yeah. of that? I, I've just written a, it's three chapters of this book I'm writing. By the way, this, di this discussion confuses foreign aid and development. They're not the same thing. Foreign aid is just a pot of money. You could use it to build an opera house in, uh, in Kabul, and it would be foreign aid. Certainly not a development project. The Japanese built a big opera house. It was very visible. It was wonderful diplomacy. For it. it has nothing to do with it in Egypt, you know, and it's a very famous opera house. But let's not confuse the two things. They're not the same thing at all. Uh, the burn rate is what AID, how AID is judged. I did not know this until after I left. I said, you should have told me you were doing to these meetings. And they said, Andrew, you are already having fights every single day, all day long. We said, we can't afford another fight, another yelling match at an NSC meeting. Our officers, and you know, both administrations are still doing the same thing. They have a monthly meeting and they look at the burn rates and DOD compares itself with state and AID in terms of how fast you're spending the money. And the AID officers would go and say, this is the dumbest thing. Because the, usually the faster you burn the money, the less effective the program is in terms of sustainability in the long term. You keep telling us this. Why don't you, you know what, it's easy to look at. And you don't have to be a development expert to see the numbers. You either burn the money or you don't burn the money. I think burn is a very appropriate term. <laughs> Doesn't mean you're spending the money wise. It means you're burning the money, okay? This has been used against AID for years, years. And our officers have had to put up with this. I've written a chap, three chapters in my book on development and the clash of the regulatory system of Washington, what's called the counter-bureaucracy in, in the political science literature, and development theory and practice. And it's very destructive. It's OMB, it's the GAO, it's the USAID IG, it's SIGUR and SIGAR, whatever it's called, the Afghan and Iraq uh, Inspector General's Office. It's now the F Office, which is the worst of all of them. And <laughs> it's the Congressional Oversight Committees. The things they judge aid by are, are the dumbest most stupid way in which to judge whether a development project is successful. But it's easy to look at, easy to read, and so you can beat people up with it. So, and we have all these metrics, hundreds and hundreds of metrics. We're getting just an avalanche of them. 
They don't tell you whether the program's sustainable, whether you've built an institution successfully, whether there's any local capacity been built, whether there's any local ownership been built. Those things don't have easy metrics, and so they don't measure them. James Q. Wilson says in his book, Bureaucracy, the risk of creating all federal agencies into what he calls production agencies, where everything's measured, is the things that can't be measured aren't funded and aren't done anymore. AID is doing service delivery because it's easier to measure and not institution building because it's hard to measure. And that is not what we should be doing in these countries. I told you you would not be bored. I told you that. Uh, Andrew Wilder. The advantage of going later is a lot of what I wanted to say has already been said. But um, thank you again for inviting me back. Uh, and apologies to some of you who I'm beginning to sound like a broken record because this issue of opposed development, if you want to call it that, or the securitization of development, I think is a very important issue, which is having a big impact on our, not only our counterinsurgency strategies, but very much on our development strategies. Um, but in my comments today, my research has been mostly Afghanistan focused, so I'm largely speaking from that perspective. Um, but I think in terms of the concept of opposed development, which I think does need more fleshing out, I mean, I think some of the questions I'd have, but most importantly probably is what are the objectives of doing development in the presence of armed opposition? Why, why bother? Why are we doing it? Um, who is opposed to the development? I mean, are we just talking in the, only the armed insurgents or, or more broadly at the community level? And also what is being opposed? I mean, is it the development uh, um, or is it the people or institutions doing the development being opposed? Um, but I want to focus on what I feel is the key issue is what are the objectives of opposed development and, and why do opposed development? Um, I mean, is it primarily in order to promote humanitarian and development objectives? I mean, basically seeing development as a good in and of itself, um, or are we primarily doing it uh, to promote stabilization and security objectives um, in order to win hearts and minds? Um, and I think it's really important to know the objectives that we're setting out to do, because I think it leads to very different kinds of programs. And I think in Afghanistan, we've seen a lot of confusion um, uh, between these two. And if I could just quote, I was um, asked um, to review a copy of a paper ISAF had produced on water resources. Um, and it was their strategy for developing water resources in Afghanistan. And it was a good, sound paper. Um, but the, just to read the objective of it, the objective of this water strategy, the intended purpose of an immediate increase in water resource investments is to speed the ability of Jeroa or the Afghan government to effectively govern, enhance its security, and significantly improve its economy with the intent of hastening a reduction of coalition involvement down to a level of training, management, and technical support. Um, which, from my perspective, is a tall order for a water project. Um, it's pretty, pretty, uh, and, a, and confused objectives. Um, but also, I think, just more fundamentally, if we take the health sector, for example, in Afghanistan, which I think is a very good example of a, of a success story in the Afghan context, where there was a, um, a good, sound policy to begin with, um, it, a fairly strong Ministry of Health leadership on it, um, good, relatively good donor coordination. Um, relatively experienced implementing partners um, and fairly good monitoring and evaluation. Um, and it's led to a very effective um, public health system called the Basic Package of Health Services, which has led to actually this is one of the few areas where I think we do have some pretty measurable results in terms of uh, reductions in maternal mortality rates and infant mortality rates. And so I think overall success. Um, but the health program in Afghanistan is not at all popular. Um, you know, pre pre preventive primary health care is not very popular. People, if you ask them, want curative services. They want hospital-based facilities, a model of health care that would be inappropriate in the Afghan context, um, uh, too expensive. And, you know, people are disappointed. They want ambulances. They want ultrasound equipment. Um, they want, again, in, uh, you know, curative facilities when the focus of the program has been health care. So in terms of winning hearts and minds, this has not been an effective program. But in terms of good development practice, I believe it has. Um, the study I've been leading at Tufts for the last couple of years has been trying to look at this issue um, uh, of sort of the securitization of aid, not from a humanitarian principles angle, you know, that it's blurring lines in terms of the military shouldn't do it or, you know, civilians are better at it, but much more from a, an effectiveness angle, you know, is um, – you know, for me, I mean, security and stability are certainly the top priorities of Afghans, not to mention the international community. And if aid is very effective 
at promoting security and stability objectives in a context like Afghanistan, I think it makes a lot of sense to securitize some of your development aid. I would keep your humanitarian aid as a separate category, which you didn't politicize. But if, it, if it's effective at promoting stability and development, a strong case can be made for securitizing certainly a significant percentage of your aid. But if it's ineffective, then it doesn't make sense. And I think that's what our research is pointing to in the Afghan context, is that there's actually not a lot of evidence, very little evidence, of significant stabilization and security benefits from the vast amounts of development aid that have been spent in Afghanistan. There are some stabilization benefits. And you know, in terms of our research, at a very local, sort of tactical level, aid projects, a small amount of money, can, can play a useful role in legitimizing an initial interaction, say of a PRT commander wanting to go talk to some tribal elders at a village level, this kind of money can have some le legitimizing effects uh, in terms of that interaction, um, maybe some consent generation for the presence of armed forces. Um, uh, but this is very much a, a transactional relationship. Um, you know, this is a, you know, buying access or renting some temporary access. This is not about winning the hearts and minds of people over to the government, which is the objective of some of these things. So again, our, evidence, our research doesn't find lots of evidence of this, but there is some certainly at a tactical level some, some benefits. Um, but the research has questioned, and you know, I'll go very quickly on this, some of the assumptions around the idea that aid projects have a stabilizing effect, and first of all, that poverty is a major cause of insecurity in Afghanistan, um, for which there's very little evidence. And so I think if that is a major assumption guiding our strategy, then we need to be rethinking it. Um, the second is the very strongest perception you often get in these interviews, especially at the PRTs that, you know, and policymakers, is that you know, we're going to do reconstruction. Reconstruction leads to economic growth, and economic growth leads to stability. So the road is going to you know, open up the area to development, which leads to stability. But you know, we know this, these linear sort of modernization theory models are somewhat ahistorical. I mean, economic growth can create winners and losers in the Afghan context, uh, and you things to fight over. Um, and, and so I think I would question, and certainly if you look at Afghan's history, to me, there's a lot more evidence about how the efforts to rapidly modernize and development off, develop Afghanistan have, in most cases, been much more destabilizing than stabilizing. Um, the very third assumption is that, very, that our aid projects actually make people like us or like their government. Um, and there's, again, very little evidence from that. At a time when more aid is going to Afghanistan than ever before in its history, the aid sector is more unpopular than ever before. And aid actors, and I, for that I include most aid actors. Um, certainly in our research, uh, no one comes out looking really good in terms of public perceptions. And I think often unfairly, because I think having worked in the Afghanistan sort of in the 80s, 90s periods, lots has been achieved as very, I, and in, in this period from a development perspective. Mm -hmm. But this doesn't seem to be translating into popularity for the government um, or for the presence of international forces. So I think that assumption should be questioned. And finally, the very idea that this, um, Behind a lot of these efforts, which is to extend the reach of the central government, which is the fundamental, uh, the main objective of the PR, stated objective of the PRTs, um, the assumption is that that is stabilizing. And certainly in our research in the south and southeast, uh, nearly inevitably in an interview with Afghan elders or religious leaders or commanders uh, about what they feel are the main causes of insecurity, the number one nearly invariably comes up as sort of the bad, corrupt, and predatory government. And so the objective of trying to expand or extend the influence of that government, um, I think, is not, uh, it's hard to argue that that's been stabilizing. Um, and then, as been alluded to earlier, I think not only is it not stabilizing, but again, a lot of the efforts are indeed destabilizing. Um, and again, this winner-loser dynamic is one of the most important ones. Um, in a, Ethnically and tribally divided society often serves a zero-sum mentality. Anyone else's gain is your loss. Uh, there's a, it's very hard to do development, even good development there, without creating perceptions that they got more than we did and generating grievances out of that. So that's a very hard dynamic to avoid, I think, in doing work in Afghanistan. Um, the press is reporting more and more about the whole aid and war economy, and I think that that needs a lot more attention than it's gotten to date in terms of the role of aid and aid contracting and the logistical contracting and security contracting in terms of uh, fueling 
are funding the Taliban, for one, but perhaps even more disturbingly in terms of consolidating the power of a very unpopular political elite um, uh, and, who, and increasingly creating vested interests uh, to maintain insecurity. And certainly in the research I was doing in Rosegan, where some of the private security companies you know, the Afghans are all joke about it. You know, you know, you create a problem to solve a problem. You know, and and you know, and, and Dexter Filkin's been reporting a bit on this in the last couple of weeks in the New York Times. Um, uh, and then the biggest issue is the corruption issue, where again, this idea that if aid is secu having a positive security effects, there's a tendency that as security deteriorates, the answer is to spend more aid. Um, but in these insecure areas where we have very limited implementation capacity, the government has a very weak capacity. We have very little capacity to provide adequate oversight in, uh, uh, of what's being done. It's been talked about already. Um, inevitably, trying to spend lots of money quickly in those environments is fueling corruption um, and, and therefore delegitimize, which is, uh, I think, playing a major role in delegitimizing the government, which I think is one of the major causes of instability. So I think, again, just to really highlight that we need to be much more aware of the destabilizing effects of this large amounts of money we're trying to spend in short order in the, in the Afghan context. Um, and then just to finally to touch on a couple issues which I think uh, um, have been alluded to already, but the unemployment issue is something I wanted to just talk about because that's, again, part of the assumption that poverty is a major cause of, of insecurity is linked to the idea that it's unemployed, angry young men who are a major cause of insurgency and therefore create jobs and lots of jobs quickly, and that will somehow have this positive impact. Um, and I think it is a factor, but I don't think it's nearly as important a factor as is assumed. Um, uh, of course, there's lots of, uh, there's lots of unemployment in Afghanistan and lots more underemployment. And so for one, I don't think we have the, you know, how much employment do we have to provide to somehow get these security effects? Um, and if it is being dri driven by money, um, if someone is getting now $6 a day to work on a USAID-funded cash-for-work program for 50 days, which is the usual, or I think 50, 60 days they're hired for on some of these projects, um, and then someone come, Taliban comes along and offers to pay three or $400 to put an IED in the road, I mean, again, what, what's to stop that? And so I, I don't um, quite understand how that's being addressed by these short-term cash-for-work programs. Um, I think we're also importing a Western notion of unemployment into the Afghan context. Um, I actually don't really know what unemployment really means in the Afghan context. In rural agrarian society like Afghanistan, where traditionally um, people cleaned their own irrigation systems and canals and, and uh, planted their fields, we now go in there and say, well, you're now unemployed, therefore we're going to pay you now to do, do the work that for centuries you used to do. So I think we're creating some dangerous precedents sort of monetizing some of the rural economy, which traditionally wasn't so. Um, and then finally, we, it's this independent actor model, the idea that people join the, un, you know, are unemployed today, so who's providing, Taliban give me $10, you give me $5, so I'll go join the Taliban. But I think the decision to join the Taliban, if you're uh, living in the South, is not one taken lightly. It has a big impact on your family, on your village, on your tribe. And so I think these are not decisions that are just motivated by economic considerations or even primarily so. I was going to say a bit about the sustainability issues, but we've talked a bit about that. I think there's very dangerous precedents of this rapid, you know, large amounts of money being spent quickly in terms of creating a bubble economy um, dependent on us to keep all these people employed and doing things. And when that, that external donor funding starts to dry up, then what? Um, and so I think, again, the danger of raising expectations, and I would argue in contexts like this, we should probably be doing less rather than more, doing a few things well and focusing on those, but not creating this bubble economy uh, of aid, which is not going to be sustainable. Um, <coughs> and just as an aside, I would argue also in terms of even the local government now, the focus on the districts. I would strongly caution against trying to do too much at the district level because the Afghan government never had effective district government. And in my view, they probably, certainly in my lifetime, probably never will. You know, we haven't really got figured out how to get Kabul to work, let alone 34 provinces. And the idea that now we want to get, you know, 400 districts or 80 priority districts functional, um, maybe we can, but then what is our exit strategy? Because there isn't the capacity in Afghanistan or the resources to sustain effective district government. And I think we need to be careful about raising expectations that district government is going to become a viable level um, of government in Afghanistan. 
So just to conclude in terms of the recommendations, um, um, again, I would definitely echo what Andrew was just saying about prioritizing quality over quantity. Um, uh, and, and that's also in some ways prioritizing more qualitative uh, research and monitoring evaluation methodologies over quantitative. I think that is a real problem that unless it, if it can't be put on a PowerPoint slide and, and quantify, then it seems to have little value. And I think that's oversimplifying these complex realities there. Again, recognize the destabilizing effects of aid. And then finally, just back to the, um, I, I think what Andrew was alluding to in terms of the three days, three Ds, but don't set development aid up to f fail by creating these unrealistic expectations of what it can do um, in terms of security objectives. Um, I think there's a lot of evidence of development aid in Afghanistan having positive development uh, effects. Uh, and there's also some bad examples as well. But there isn't a lot of evidence yet about having positive security effects. And I think we really r run the risk of discrediting development aid and setting it up to fail by expecting it to somehow have a major impact on defeating the insurgency. And I know, especially in this town, being able to say that the development aid has a security benefit is pretty useful in terms of getting resources and getting a seat at the table. So I, I recognize the value in practical terms of linking our development very closely to our security. But if it's ineffective in the long term, we risk discrediting development aid and having it a dis uh, not no longer valued because it's perceived to have failed in terms of defeating an insurgency in Afghanistan. So thank you very much. Good. Andrew, um, questions? Yeah, this Andrew. The worst thing we do, and the UN does it, and we go along with, in fact, we tell the UN to do it, is these international pledging conferences. Most Afghans and Iraqi, they don't remember all. The one thing they remember is when they announce after these pledging conferences that the donors pledge $10 billion. Most of them don't know what $10 billion is, but it sounds like a huge amount of money, and it creates the expectation which is one of the re – I think one of the dangers of these interviews with their very friend. There are limitations to doing interviews because people sometimes – if you – if you, I ask people, you know, myself when I go into the field, where did you get that information from or what's the basis for your saying that? When you start to drill down, they don't have a basis for it. Rumor, they heard something on the radio, or it's the perception. The, big, the biggest problem we have is creating expectations through these pledging conferences, which the Afghans then keep repeating. I mean, the, the, I used to be driven nuts by the Sudanese government. You promised to do this much money in uh, southern Sudan. You're, you're not doing it. I said, well, number one, the U.S. government is doing more than they pledged by far in southern Sudan. But, you, but it's always used as a propaganda tool by people who are opposed to what's going on. So I think actually we should abolish having these international pledging conferences. I think they're actually destructive to the process, and they create expectations which are very dangerous. Nancy. <laughs> Um, two points that um, you raised that I, that I think are really interesting. The first is, you know, the securitization of aid. I, I, I think there's a difference between a narrow definition of security and a much broader mm -hmm. definition of the relationship of development to security. And where I get very hopeful is the possibility of the new um, presidential secured, uh, development strategy to reframe development as part of a broadly defined national security agenda, where by having – um, trusted partners, you, you know, who are able to meet the needs of their people globally engaged in solving some of the world's problems. And so I, I think it's important that we start reframing the security issue as that more broadly defi uh, defined agenda and the role of development in helping us get there. Um, and then secondly... Nancy, can I, can I interrupt right there? Hold on to your second point. Don't, okay. don't lose it. Uh, Andrew, I was going to ask this question too, but when you said securitization of the development, if you could just define what you meant by that. Well, basically, it's the trend of using our development aid much more explicitly to achieve security objectives as opposed to, say, first and foremost, development objectives. Okay. And, okay. you know, the two are arguably linked, and I'm arguing, well, the evidence base of the link is weak, but it's overall we're seeing very explicitly now USAID's strategy in Afghanistan was defined last year as to support our counterinsurgency uh -huh. um, objectives. Uh, so and that's security supporting of development as a supporting role to achieve our security it. objectives. Good. And, Good. And, and I would agree with you that I don't think that's linking to the broader vision that we're mm -hmm. hoping will emerge with the, the, um, the development strategy that we all as a country need to have. That gets to that definitional mm -hmm. clarity. The second thing, I mean, I really want to affirm the importance of looking at this from an aid effectiveness per, uh, approach. And mm -hmm. in the study that we did, we tried very hard. One of the to, to, do, to link it to effectiveness, and one of the effectiveness factors 
it that we looked at is how is it perceived by the communities and what is it that they value and how do they find advantages in the activities and the both the interviews and the degree to which we have survey research shows that they really value that community led process which we defined by three factors yeah and I just on that that came out very strongly in our research too and I also wanted to reemphasize that when I say that perceptions of aid and aid actors are very bad it doesn't mean to say that I think that there's no good news again I think lots has been done and in our research to some the better perceived programs were what for example like the National Solidarity Program where there's you know a process involved in the process is as important often as the product and it's a relatively small amount of money that can be managed there is a monitoring and evaluation dimension to it and these things were more positively perceived and because I think of that community development approach and I think it was having clearly there's evidence of those having positive development outcomes what we did not find was envy any evidence of even good well perceived development programs necessarily having discernible stabilization or security benefit so even good development doesn't necessarily lead to security if the drivers of insurgency are not primarily related to issues like poverty and unemployment I mean in our research we did the bad governance comes up as the main one neighboring countries comes up as one sense of ethnic grievance tribal intertribal disputes I mean a long list of things are fueling the insurgency in Afghanistan we seem to be pinning a lot of our hopes that it's unemployment derived its legitimacy from delivering social services to its population and roads it's been much more closely linked to religion justice security and so not coincidentally I believe that's what the Taliban offer we offer roads schools clinics and so those benefits and I think because I think that's what we felt was going to be important to legitimize the government a big focus to get those Kabul Kandahar road built before the Karzai first the presidential election because the idea that that road would help legitimize and make him popular and just as an aside I think I don't I'm not an expert on Iraq and Bill hey Bill you can speak more to this I think in the Iraq context where you had a lot of infrastructure and roads and a fairly developed economy when those were damaged and destroyed in the war in that context maybe getting those up and running was a much more important factor in terms of winning hearts and minds and and it was an important source of grievance but in Afghanistan you know those things didn't exist so I think it's quite a different situation in Afghanistan good Andrew any you just one comment I think it's important not to conflate stabilization programming with development and I think the development in a counterinsurgency environment still has a very valuable role but it isn't winning hearts and minds in fact the whole concept of winning hearts and minds has been very thoroughly discredited in the counterinsurgency community in the last 20 years ever since a lot of work on on choice theory as a thing from gratitude theory has shown us that you can bring all kinds of benefits to a population it's not going to necessarily make them like you and also that doesn't actually matter very much whether they like you or not so actually the role of long-term development is twofold firstly it's capacity building so that you can finally unask the place after 10 or 15 years because somebody in there can take take over responsibility and that that's nothing to do with any hearts and minds it's about allowing the government to get around and do the things that needs to do to take over suppressing the insurgency when you leave and the other thing is consent generation which Andrew talked about and I think that's a big key to why we've done a lot of the things we've done in Afghanistan because the international community felt that it needed to show it was bringing some kind of benefit to the Afghan people in order to legitimize the the international presence not only in the eyes of the Afghans primarily in the eyes of the contributing countries that were putting people in and I think you may or may not see that as a valid activity but it's nothing to do with stabilization or security it's 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 a political strategic activity one thing I'd say on that is I absolutely agree that the thinkers on coin David foremost understand that but in practice in the field and doing the interview the notion of winning hearts and minds is alive and well yes there was an outstanding number of stupid folks executing that is true let me just add one comment Nancy you talked about the national security strategy the national security strategy is going to have development strategy I'm sorry of the administration like other ones in the past through other administration they have almost no effect on the actual practice of aid because it is driven now not by strategies from the White House but by the regulatory process 
if you look at how A does its work, it's driven by the burn rate. It's driven by OMB's part annual evaluation of each aid program, which is, frankly, an enormous waste of time. Uh, it's the F office, which is now more powerful than it was before. It's, it's because the aid administrator is no longer in charge of it. It's the IG. It's the SIGUR. The, I mean, AID officers get, go to these meetings. They present these reports, and they beat the crap out of the aid officers when, in <coughs> fact, the, these regulatory apparatus in Washington have completely misunderstood what the purpose of these programs are. When you read that, you read that little uh, quip of what the uh, – you don't think an aid officer wrote that whole thing. AID wrote part of that. It's then sent up through Ambassador Holbrook and the mission, and you know what they do? They rewrite, they add up all that other crap to it, so it's completely incoherent. So That's Andrew, what happens. Andrew, I understand this is in your book. Is that right? This well, is coming no, in your the, book. The, the stuff okay. about the regulatory apparatus <laughs> right, will be published in the next two weeks <laughs> okay. by the Center for Global Development. Thank you. Uh, we'll look forward to it. That's great. And we're looking forward to Jim Shear, who I know has a plane to catch at some point, not too long. So uh, I appreciate your sticking through this, and, uh, and over to you. Well, first of all, I, uh, I have to convey uh, heartfelt thanks, not only to the <coughs> organizers, uh, but to colleagues. I think I have learned more in the last hour and 15 minutes than I have in many months, quite frankly. It's been terrific. It's been an education. And uh, as the caboose on this train, let me just make a, two or three quick points, and I do apologize. I'm heading for a plane in just a little bit. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm delighted that Dave Kilcullen actually uh, defined and, and made some interesting differentiations uh, in this uh, cohort of opposers. Um, some of my early uh, field experiences back in the early 1990s were in Cambodia. And you could drive through Takeo and Kampot provinces and see Khmer Rouge in black pajamas taking a few tolls, not next to government police, but down the road. Interestingly, after their time, their awful time in government, but back in, back uh, pushed out into the northwest, they d divided villages out. They, you know, the best way to tell if the KR were there is that the road just ceased, you know, blocked off. The separation was key. So this, these were adamant opposers at one point who became toll takers. Uh, they seemed to, as and was said by other colleagues, toll taking became part of their MO, and suddenly Kusan Pan would show up in Bangkok and get some nice suits and fly into Phnom Penh to be part of the UN peace process. So, you know, you're wondering, this is an insurgency that was dying, maybe because it was evolving in terms of its, its uh, attitudes toward the outside world. Interesting question. Also, very much on the competitor side, I think, uh, as we see today in parts of Afghanistan, there is a competitive quality to this. I very much appreciate uh, Dave's differentiation. I've learned a lot from other colleagues here, uh, visibility versus viability. Uh, the, the, the aid uh, as an insurgency, uh, USAID, uh, <laughs> which is an interesting concept. Uh, and I have to say there's, there's an irony wrapped in this whole thing, which is looking back over the last few decades, uh, we as, as a country have actually done a lot of insurgent support. Uh, we sent uh, Mike Hessen to Kosovo, who helped reestablish the banking system in a robustly uh, independent province uh, uh, in the face of a very heavy-handed counter-insurgency, uh, which we helped to dislodge. Um, there are other examples, too. Uh, East Timor, we and the Aussies helped keep Fallon until sort of armed, but in cantonments until the right time. I mean, you go on and on. There are other cases, too. Now, insurgencies and support can lead to separation, secession, separate states, and development opportunities there, too. We are talking about coin, though, counterinsurgency, and it is, it is hard, and I, I acknowledge that, and a lot of good criticisms uh, have, have been made here. Let me just tick off a few things that I would like to say. I draw from this that we are, we corporately, the uh, U.S. Uh, US government, uh, and it is the three Ds, and I, uh, we uh, perhaps need a better construct on that. Um, flexible resources, huge. Whether it's cross-sector, you know, rule of law here, economic development there, that, that's very <coughs> challenging. And I'm sure Andrew can give us chapter and verse on the problems of, of flexible resources. Stay tuned on that one. Uh, blended expertise, number two, yes. 
need development experts with commanders at every level where the military is present in an expeditionary mode because there is this balance between quick impact, and I will plead guilty to an, an interest in quick impact, but how you make sure that's a sustainable impact so that the school or the clinic you build tomorrow has teachers or doctors in three or four months uh, uh, or a year. Um, and so uh, expertise is, is critical, and I think the U.S. Uh, Defense Department would be the first to uh, claim that it needs, it, it needs uh, a tremendous amount of expertise at lower levels. Uh, third, a, a uh, understandable degree of separation uh, with NGOs um, who define their op as a key to their operational effectiveness to be separate and independent. Uh, there's always a need for better cross-communication um, and better knowledge of each other while protecting some extent privacy concerns and we are working on the spot issue. Um, uh, that said, let me just say that uh, there are multiple problems in the field in complex environments. Guilt by association with guys with guns is one of those problems, but you can have guilt by association with the development assistance you're supplying, uh, girls' schools in south, southeastern Afghanistan. So, you know, it's complex, and, it's, and I would say yes, the separation from military organizations is key, but it's, it's not the sufficient condition for success <laughs> in the field. Um, third point, um, fencing in uh, problematic partners. Uh, lots of partners in the field, and I think we've heard today that uh, on issues of corruption, elite capture, and so forth, there are problematic partners. I don't think I'll go into that in any more detail, but it's, it's a clear and present issue that we, that we all wrestle with. Uh, local buy-in. Uh, huge and very significant and, uh, uh, and great appreciation to Mercy Corps for its effort looking at community-led development on that and how to achieve real local buy-in. Recognizing that one impediment oftentimes is a national aspiration in the capital, distant as it is, relative to the aspirations of the local community at the district level. Not always in sync, sometimes difficult in various operating environments. Um, and uh, finally, uh, it's a bit provocative, let's be open to uh, remedial destabilization. Uh, we're, we're all going to make mistakes in these environments, and, and a lot of money is at risk. Uh, and that's not, it's not a popular thing to say to a congressional staffer, to say we're, we're going to make some risky investments here. But let's be open to, uh, uh, to making some mistakes, learning from them. Uh, and uh, remedial work can be destabilizing at times, given the society involved, what we're achieving to do. We have to be practical and realistic. I, there's no question about uh, the dangers of trying to do too much too fast. But uh, let's be open to at least making a few mistakes, provided we can learn mm -hmm. from them. On that, I will conclude. And. And so if, there, if you have time for any questions I from do. this crew here, and then this also is going to lead into questions from uh, uh, this crew here. Sure. But uh, from, the, from the panel, any, anybody have anything for Jim before he has to go? If not, well, hey, well, okay, then this is a good opportunity. Yeah. Well, I, really quickly, I'd please. love to hear just one more sentence on remedial destabilization mm -hmm. and if you mean something different than just the ability to have um, greater risk-taking ability. And Jim, while you, while you answer that, uh, as you're thinking of your answer to that, um, let me invite people to do what we've already started doing, is that is if you would like to ask someone a question yeah. in particular, Jim Shear, but others as well, please just come to these two mics, um, and we will then take questions, but uh, Nancy has just asked one. And, and appreciation for tackling spot or looking into it. Uh, it is mainly about allowing and being tolerant of risk-taking, but it's also a question of um, making – some effort to uh, uh, bring uh, uh, strong uh, voices and interests into a mix on, on priorities, which doesn't mm -hmm. reflect, reflect just the prevalent view of the leadership you're dealing with. And I will now sit down and let the ah, floor Very good, go. very good. Okay. 
thank you all very much. This is exactly what we had hoped for here. And uh, now we have an opportunity for those, and, and you've been standing longest, so why don't you start? <laughs> if you'll just uh, let people know who you are and direct your question to a person. Afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is John Patton, uh, State Department, Office of the Coordinator of Reconstruction and Stabilization. Uh, I have some connection to all of you, whether NGO background, Feinstein Center, uh, USAID field officer in Kandahar for two years, uh, regional DEVAD, uh, and now on Afghan pre-deployment training. Uh, for the civilians that are going out under the SREP mandate. Uh, so there, I, I do have uh, some questions here. There are many interconnected issues, of course. I think there are many commonalities or linkages to some of the uh, uh, seemingly intractable problems we brought up on this. But one thing I should mention, and what we are training, whether it's a, at a, a civ mill training or the civilian specifically, or it's at, if it's at a brigade combat team, we pretty much have stricken the phrases hearts and minds out of any training materials, including extending the reach of the Afghan government. Uh, certainly there are a lot of uh, uh, governance programs uh, being focused to that to actually link people to uh, – not non-corrupt systems, but, but at the community level or at the district level uh, to actually connect people to services that should be run uh, by GIROA. Uh, and let, let, me, uh, let me shift focus here to um, the actual questions. One, one of the things we're missing, I believe, is at the community level, and Nancy, you raised this about what the people need or what the people want. There are some problems with this still. Uh, in, including who are the power brokers and what are the power dynamics in a particular area, especially at the very community level. Uh, we have people that say, uh, well, we want to talk to the elders or we want to uh, uh, talk to the shuras. Often these are uh, uh, power brokers but are not representative of the people. So I, I think that is a missing link there as far as some of our programming. So I don't know if, if, if any of you have an answer. Okay, how do we get down to some of those core grievances or some of those underlying dynamics in instability. We certainly do not train a project approach at all. Uh, we work closely with USAID OMA on, on how you actually uh, uh, analyze some of this and actually triangulate some information to get down. What, what kind of program do we have, uh, programming do we need to do uh, based on uh, uh, the things that can actually stabilize the air. And I, I don't think we're there yet, but I was wondering if, Nancy, if you could just yeah, drip from the NGO perspective. Well, from the NGO perspective, and I also think from a community-led development perspective, you know, one of the things that we found in our study, which I think is reflective of a practice that many people try to follow, is um, the principle of participation, where you go beyond just, you know, mm -hmm. cl clearly in Afghanistan often it means women, but it could also mean just others who are excluded from some of the traditional power structures. Um, Andrew talked a little bit, um, I think as Dave did as well, about the destabilization of vast amounts of resources, where I think you, you really, when you really push a lot of money into a community, you exacerbate some of those tensions that you talk about. And so that's why when you've got a very participatory approach where you broaden who's at the table, and then they have to contribute, so it's their project you know, not Mercy Corps' project or, or the USG's project, that, that um, has some greater effectiveness in dealing with absolutely very real dynamics that one has to stay alert to. But it also requires a much longer time frame. Longer right. time frame, a lot of tea. Well, and that's the, that's the policy question I, I don't think, you know, we've really gotten to yet. And, and Andrew, I would actually challenge you on these. Uh, as, last question, because so I, I want to give other people the... Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm happy to be challenged. Yeah. No, the, the, the whole issue Which of... Which Andrew are you speaking about? Uh, Andrew Wilder and uh, um, the, uh, the, the whole issue of, of some of the programs, uh, whether uh, we're talking long-term development or whether we're talking uh, ostensibly for stability, the whole thing about employment. Uh, I, I agree strongly, Andrew. Okay, what happens on day 90 uh, when these guys aren't working anymore? It, it's, still, it's still a real issue. Seed program when I was there was, uh, was a disaster um, because a lot of the things we're doing, even people that thought they were a good project, were not connected in any way to local officials that are responsible at the line directorates for basic services. So they have to be linked. And, and a lot of that stuff did exacerbate conflict. And, and I know that's a question, not a question there, but th that's something we still need to consider. Good question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you want to talk about the seed program? Okay. Seed, the wheat seed? You mean the wheat seed? Wheat seed, I think you're There were various right. seed programs yeah. there. Well, and the wheat seed program I was talking about was the one we started in the spring of 2002. Yes, and which was I, wiped I out recently. Seed, 
Pardon me? Which was undermined recently by another massive distribution. What had become a sustainable produce... Most seed programs have undermined the agriculture directorate there. Ambassador Litt. David Litt, retired Foreign Service officer and now director of the Center for Stabilization and Economic Reconstruction in Chapel Hill. Arguably one of the more prominent battlegrounds right now where we can conflate securitization of development and development issues is Yemen. I'd be very interested to hear any and all of you. Maybe Andrew Wilder gets a pass, I don't know. But I'd like to hear all of your perspectives on what should be a way ahead in Yemen and what should not be. I'm going to defer to you. Okay. Well, I was going to actually defer to Nancy because Mushka is actually working very heavily in the Horn of Africa, and I think you're doing some work in Yemen. But I think we know from experience that the approaches that are appropriate in a mature conflict environment are not necessarily appropriate in an incipient conflict environment, and that one of the things that can happen is that if you jump in with both feet with programs that might make sense in Iraq or Afghanistan to somewhere like Yemen, you can actually have a destabilizing effect, or you may, in fact, have the opposite. And one of the issues we've discovered is that expectation management early in conflicts becomes very, very important. Too often we've seen people go in and say, tell us all your grievances, tell us all your problems, and they come out with a list of 50 or 60 grievances, and then they say, we're going to fix these. And that's great for the first guy in the tour, but every time you do that, you raise and then disappoint expectations. And by the time the third or fourth person is in there, they're mm -hmm. battling against a whole wall of disappointed expectations that have arisen from the best of possible intentions early in the program. Um, I think the most important thing you can do early, and I, I think I know we agree on this from our time in Iraq, is uh, educate people in the aid mission and the embassy itself on how to recognize changes in the environment early enough to communicate those to Washington. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's not about d delivering development. It's about c country team uh, internal skill set. Uh, you know, we, we aren't broadly in Yemen, in part because um, we're very reluctant to work in an environment where it's so explicitly and so publicly um, a, a, a special ops insurgent hunt. Um, according to the RFAs on the website and the way they're worded. And so, you know, I think the, the coin, I, I mean, you made the point, David, that a good coin strategy, there's a lot of overlap with good development. But I think if you fence everything inside what is seen as a military frame, you undermine the good development, even though the elements may be quite similar. So it's a little bit of a conceptual, um, convert, you know, understanding to have. What I, what I will say in the Horn more broadly is there was a GAO report that came out in April that looked at what was the harm done by a number of projects uh, undertaken by uh, forces associated with AFRICOM where they were dilapidated after a short, you know, there was no community development um, or community ownership factor. So uh, structures were built and abandoned um, but still labeled as, you know, so visibility gone, uh, gone bad. Um, and exacerbating some of the community structures by this grievance approach. So I think um, we, would, we would be well served to, in an incipient conflict environment, look at what are the ways to appropriately be involved and in, with which actors to accomplish what purpose um, and not assume that um, – I don't think you would call that coin strategy, though. No, it's I, more I, the old I think, hearts I, and minds approach. Uh -huh. I, yeah, I, I think that we've, we've found through, pra through practical experience that bottom-up community-led peace building – approaches have a much greater chance of success, um, certainly in the early stages of conflict, or, and definitely once a conflict is fu fully blown, than government-led, top-down security approaches. Um, and I think it's important that people understand that and how community-led development fits into that. Of course, when you do get to, you know, the Battle of Fallujah in 2004, it's past the stage for that, you know, but, yeah. Better. Just on that issue, because I think it really is a critical one, which is it's hard to find anyone who's not a development practitioner or a coin practitioner on the ground that understands these issues who doesn't ultimately conclude that the tsunami of cash that David referred to is harmful and having negative impact both developmentally and as well as from a security angle. And to me, that's how can we address that in this town when it's identified that too much money is a big part of the problem 
but we seem unable to close well, off the taps. I know I keep referring to these guys, but we need to be shifting away <laughs> from input metrics mm -hmm. to impact and, and, and outcome metrics. And I, when I was Secretary Rice's advisor, I had brief after brief where people would say, this is the effect we're having in Afghanistan. And the briefing would be how many schools we build or how many kilometres of road we lay down. That's inputs. It doesn't tell you anything about what you're actually doing and what, what effect you're having. And I think once we shift to that, you can actually quantify effect. Um, we just haven't tried very, very much. Well, well, it's let, let me just add something. We had yelling matches every month. Mark Ward would go to the meetings. This, this, this disbursement obsession you have with the burn rate is undermining the education program. We would discuss this every week. You know, we'd say the more important metric, how many kids are in school? Are the teachers in school most of the week? Because sometimes they don't report. Are they getting paid? Are there textbooks in the school? And then there is another metric, which is hard, harder to assess. Do the kids actually learn anything while they're in the school? <laughs> you know, what's, what's fascinating to me is some of the most conservative people, and I'm a conservative, in the city would never use a metric in the United States domestically by how many schools we rehabbed as a, as a metric for determining whether we had a functional education program. No conservative would argue that. They would always argue, are the kids literate when they leave school? So I find it very odd that some of the people who are most demanding for these metrics are the people who would never use that metric domestically in the United States. I mean, it doesn't make any sense to me at all. But it, it, the, the debate is there. I think the reason, frankly, is it's easy to, to track disbursement rates. It's much harder to get into the quantitative measurement stuff. Now, we used to have an office in aid, the CDIE office. The, the, uh, it's a Center for Development Information and Evaluation. I, when, I did, when I was doing research in my book in Paris at the OECD, the director, who's New Zealander, he said, how is CDIE doing? I said, CDIE has been abolished. My successor abolished it. He said, that can't be possible. It was the gold standard. We actually used CID more than the World Bank to determine, because you know what they did? Impact evaluations. <laughs> they did impact. And they abolished it. They said, this is useless stuff. I said, because it's, it's not. It's what, back. Well, I know it's, it's back in theory. Uh, okay, it has theory. not been funded. <laughs> it has not been funded. And we don't know whether there is an obsession in this city with metrics, even with an AID now. And I think it's, it's because we're being driven by the IG, the GO, and all these people to produce these numbers. They can create a new evaluation office that is metrics driven, which would be, I think, exactly the wrong thing to do. So it's the devil in the detail that counts. Thank you. Excellent. Next question. I have so many questions and comments. I don't know where to start. <coughs> no, no, but this has to be short. In fact, is, I, short. I'm thinking that the people who are at the mics now, I think okay. we'll end at the last one here. And that, that, that it may even take. take a bunch of questions? That's probably not a bad idea. We'll take two at a time. Okay. So let's take one here and one here, and then we'll answer them, and then we'll go to the And answer. comments are okay as well, right? <laughs> comments are okay. You don't have to. That's right. You don't have to. Ask I have a comment for the panel. Uh, my name is Sloan Mann. I'm with Development Transformations. I think the first thing I'm going to do is send a note to Obama and ask him to create a task force. Of primarily made up of people on this panel to fix foreign assistance from top to bottom. So incredibly interesting discussion today. Um, I've enjoyed it, and I think there's a lot of experience and depth of knowledge that we could use to fix some of these broken mechanisms. Um, I wanted to comment on post development uh, versus stability programming. Reminds me briefly of the ongoing discussions in the military between COIN and stability mm -hmm. operations. Is stability operations a thing that we do, or is it an coin environment we find ourselves in, and other people say, well, coin is a subset of stability operations, and I think that I look at opposed development as almost a subset of stability programming. Stability programming doesn't, um, can happen anywhere where there's, where there's instability, and that's not necessarily defined by an insurgency. I feel like in opposed development, you have to have an active, as you said, a competing program working against you. Uh, I wonder if the, the panel had a comment on that. And then briefly, Nancy, I couldn't agree with you more when you said that Stability um, necessary to begin the pathway to development. I mean, that's absolutely critical, one of the things that we uh, continue to push in our training. So what's the approach to stabilize the environment? And that's what I would argue is stability programming or stability assistance is what we call it. And uh, I'll stop, stop there. Thank you. And so hang on to comments on that if there are. And question here. Thank you. Uh, I am Fahim Hashimi, a Fulbright Scholar from Afghanistan. Thank you very much for your very enlightening uh, information and uh, feedbacks about Afghanistan situation. But I have a question uh, plus a comment about what you talked about. I really um, agree uh, that uh, unemployment in uh, neighboring countries uh, impact and ethnicity and other problems uh, impacts the current situation in Afghanistan. 
Uh, and also, I agree that some of the projects have been successful and some of them have failed. But I think there uh, are some reasons for why projects uh, success, uh, succeed and uh, why they fail. Uh, for me, uh, the reason for success of projects like radio and TV stations in Afghanistan was the right choice of project. It was what people wanted in Afghanistan. Second was the right uh, choice of staff that some educated and uh, committed people were uh, uh, chosen and uh, uh, employed for them. And it was uh, right rewarding. People who work for radio and TV station in Afghanistan are highly paid rather than uh, public servants. And it is why they do good job and it uh, incur to the success of uh, the project itself. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the reason for failure of some of the projects is the same, same thing that I mentioned. Let me uh, give an example of our, our national police. Uh, first of all, uh, the right uh, choose of staff, because most of the people who are in our national police, they are not educated, they are not committed, uh, committed people, and just they uh, get into national police in order to find a job and make money. Uh, so second, uh, it's about rewarding. The salary of our national police is uh, so low, uh, which is about from uh, 100 to 200 dollars, which is nothing in uh, Afghanistan. So, uh, accepted or not, people who uh, gets into our national police, they committed, uh, they commit uh, administration corruption or do bribery or something in order to make a living for themselves. And this uh, fact uh, is applicable to our entire uh, public servants, which has uh, caused administration corruption in current government of Afghanistan. I wonder uh, if there is any uh, fundamental uh, projects in order to eradicate uh, the causes for these failures in Afghanistan ongoing, or what do you suggest to how we could get rid of this uh, current situation in Afghanistan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good questions, uh, which we will answer both of these at the same time. But uh, who would like to take the first one from Sloan? Or uh, that was mainly a good comment. That was mainly a good comment. Yeah. 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 They, they agree. Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. Except being on some panel or something. Yeah. For, for yeah. the Obama administration. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Let me comment on the Please. Uh, comment on because. People have raised the corruption issue. I, I actually think there's a lot of misunderstanding of this. It's too we, we're, we're too close to the end to go into it in depth. We did a survey when we started an anti-corruption program, because we do it in most countries before. We asked public attitudes. Is corruption against the law, and is it bad? And the survey results nationally in Afghanistan showed 27% of the people thought corruption was bad and that it was illegal. Over 70% of the people said it's legal, and it's normal, and there's nothing wrong with it, 70 percent. So uh, you can do your surveys, but I have to tell you, this is a problem in many developing countries. They think it is culturally acceptable, and they don't see it as a problem. I mean, uh, and if you have a vast majority of the population who says, it's not that they tolerate it. They don't actually see it that it's against the law, and they don't see it as a um, – an evil thing that's, you know, under, because when you go into the whole notion that corruption is, a, is undermines public administration, presumes a Western technocratic approach to service delivery through the government. That's not how people view the government in most developing countries. The, the, there's a book on this broad subject of, uh, of culture and development by um, Douglas North called Violence and Social Orders. I would urge everyone to read it. He won the Nobel Prize for Economics. His work is now being widely read in Europe and at the World Bank, and I think the reason we're misunderstanding what this is from a cultural standpoint, what these terms mean. They mean something very different there than they do for us. Thank you. Could I Andrew, please. Follow, I actually think this corruption thing is critical, and I think I would further distinguish between petty corruption. If you have to go to the visa office, passport office, and pay a little money to get your passport, that, that's annoying, but it's accepted as mm -hmm. standard practice. But it's taken to the levels of the corruption in terms of the, the perception that a small political elite are getting fabulously wealthy um, at the expense of other groups, and it's partly that winner-loser dynamic that they're getting more than we are. 
that, I think, is deeply unpopular and destabilizing. And so I personally would not agree that corruption is not a serious problem or perceived oh, as no, a serious – or that only 27 percent think that it's a serious problem in Afghanistan, because certainly in the interviewing we're doing, um, it comes out as a much more significant uh, uh, factor there, especially in terms of elite capture um, of a lot of the goods. And that, that's the level of corruption which I think is particularly destabilizing. And so where a lot of our aid resources, we want to be, again, strengthening the government, but it's then perceived to be enriching and empowering a few at the expense of others, that I think is where we're getting into these prob problems. Good distinction. Last three questions then. Let's take all three. Um, where do we start? we will start over here and go over there. Hi, my name is Peter Coharis. I have a, a principal at a small uh, international law consulting firm. In another life, I worked for an NGO in Asia and for UNICEF in Africa. Um, in the category of shameless plugs, I, I wanted to refer you folks to a, an article I co-authored in Parameters, which is the uh, strategic journal of the U.S. Army War College called Counterinsurgency 3.0. Uh, Mr. We quoted one of Mr. Wilder's articles, and I think a number of you would be would, would find some of our points resonating. I think Nancy, your points about bottom up, um, I th we focus on that quite a bit. We also take on the smart power consensus. I, I wanted to shift gears though, uh, and put something to the panel. It may be that all of us and our thinking <coughs> has radically or should radically change in light of an announcement last week that, and I happen to do this in terms of my legal capacity, working with host governments and extractive industries, there is apparently $950 billion worth of precious resources, minerals, in Afghanistan. If that amount is staggering, I think we would all agree, and how we think about development, how we think about the national government, how we think about uh, access to the resources, developing the resources, licensing these resources, corruption, all of these issues now are in a completely different realm as a result if it, of this information, this news. And I know the Afghan government is quite excited among other people. And, and we may not have the capacity to think about this now in this, in this panel, but this changes everything or has the potential to change everything in terms of what we've been discussing. So I just want to throw that out there for you folks to, to talk good, about. Very good. Very good. That's, that's on our list. Um, sir. I'm Bill Stubner from the Lewis Berger Group. Uh, first of all, Dr. Kilcullen, I just want to thank you for the book you authored, this last one, and I'm looking forward to the next one. We're actually using some of your framework to bump against our integrated development programs to try to see, are, are we doing things that way, and, and can we validate some of what you said? But um, my question is going to be for Andrew Nacios. Uh, Andrew, and I don't know if you've been notified. I apologize if you haven't, but our our Fred Cuny of of uh, engineering development, Jim Meyer, has passed away very recently. I don't know if anyone told you that. This was the guy that really was a miracle worker on the Kandahar Kabul Road. But um, this is about not just the incredible shrinking USAID, but also I think I, I assume you're going to be addressing this in your book. But the increasing bureaucratization that we've seen over the last 10, 15, 20 years, uh, as you know, when I introduce you places, I always say this is the guy that sent me to my death in 1992. Uh, but you were, you were able to send a USAID person out into the field at that time, outside the wire, to get the answers. And one of the things I, uh, just a few weeks ago, I briefed 40 foreign service officers who are going to be deploying to Afghanistan this summer. Only two had ever been in a conflict area. And uh, most of them had no expectation that they were going to be going outside the wire. Uh, people like Nancy's people, our people, we are out there. And we have a real communications problem. Uh, when Carl Eikenberry was going out, I had breakfast with him just before he went out to be the ambassador. And he said, well, what would be the most important thing for me to do? And I, mm -hmm. I said, try to find a way to get away around some of the restrictions <coughs> to get the AID people and State Department people outside the wire. Uh, did your book address that? And if so, how do you think we're going to solve that problem? Yeah. Thank you, Bill. Good, good question. And last question. So you've got that, Andrew, right? Yeah. Got the, okay. Very good. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I'm Ann Sweetser. I'm a social anthropologist. 
I've worked for the past decade with the Asian Development Bank, but before that, uh, in the mid-90s, I was working on something called the Participation Initiative in the Policy and Planning uh, Program Coordination Bureau. So what the, the, comment, the question about the current training um, got me out of my seat. Um, it's, it's another example of a body of material that was developed over a period of time within USAID that seems to have been completely forgotten. Um, I, one question I have concerns the government in a box, and uh, if anybody would like to comment on that. When I think of governance, I think of you build the road, but you get some local NGOs or somebody or community members to decide how they are going to monitor the culverts and the drains so that your flat surface with drains will continue to be functional. And, and then you think about the relationship between those people in the community and the, the local and the district and so on, governments, and, and how they can be responsive. Um, that notion of governments is a complete contrary notion than something that comes in a box. Um, which is something that troubles me. So, thank you. Good. Thank you. Okay. So, we have from Peter, we have the minerals in Afghanistan, the trillion dollars. From Bill, uh, from Louis Berger, we've got uh, a question for Andrew on aid and others outside the wire. And Anne on gov governance or government in a box. Um, uh, can, can, just, let me just go quick. Okay. The, the notion of a trillion dollars, that has been around for 30 years. Mm -hmm. There are three dozen studies by AID and the World Bank that go back to the 1970s. We did an assessment in 2002 of the same thing. We gave it to the military. They saw it. It's no new thing. The reason we didn't pursue it is there's a warlord mining in a very bad way. It destroys half the stuff he's mining. And he told us if you get any legitimate contract, we'll kill them all. Okay? So there's a small problem with security, and a warlord controls the area. No one is touching those minerals until there's security, and there isn't any security. And this is not new. It's been around for years. The World Bank is full of these surveys, and so is AID and the other European donors. Second, with respect to the imprisonment of AID, they call AID mission in Kabul the AID staff, the prison. That's what it's called, the prison, by the career staff. No one gets out. Someone can be there for six months and never leave. The security restrictions, uh, because of the 1998 security, uh, Embassy Security Act, are draconian. No other donor goes through this. We are, if we had these restrictions the US, for the Defense Department, we'd never fight any wars anywhere. And it's not just AID, it's the embassy too. It's ridiculous. And it's not just in Afghanistan. It's in Uganda, it's in Kenya. You can't leave Nairobi without getting a permit from DS, which is preposterous. Kenya. And by the way, the rural Kenya is much more stable than, than uh, Nairobi is in terms of security, so it's a little bizarre. It, it is out of control, and the only way to fix it is to go to the government regulations, the committee that pass that le legislation and, re and change the law. And they won't do it. They will not do it. So until that law changes, DS is going to enforce rules that make it almost impossible to get out so that no one gets killed. Well, we're in the middle of a war. You want to run development programs, you have to go out and look at them. And that means risk. And people are not willing to take risk in the federal government under these circumstances. 